Hi, everybody. Welcome to DAFED number 27. Tonight I'm going to speak in English because we have English speaker here. Sorry. <laughs> Don't worry, they all, know, they all speak English as well. <laughs> uh, first, I have to say that I, I am so glad to see, to see you all uh, tonight here. Uh, it's great to see that DAFED is becoming bigger and bigger from month to month. So thank you. Uh, we, will not, uh, we will start uh, right away because I know that there are people that are standing and it will be hard for them tonight. <laughs> uh, but first I will announce um, our partner organization. Uh, they have some interesting uh, project to talk about, so their representative will tell you something more. Victoria, please. Yeah, and if somebody has to leave, we will understand. <laughs> First of all, I'm sorry I will speak in English. If you're interested, you're welcome to participate with us, but I don't think you will be in, uh, in Serbia for um, half of December. No, I'm afraid not. <laughs> okay. Anyway, you can check online what's going on. Dobroveče svima. Moje ime je Viktorija Petrov i ja imam ovu divnu priliku pred ovolikim auditorijumom da kažem šta smo mi to spremili. Biću kratka jer znam da ide izuzetno interesantno predavanje. Reč je o programu nstarter, nstarter.co. Spremili smo niz ili sedam, tačnije tema, da vam pomognemo da postanete još bolji preduzetnici jer se nadam ili trebalo bi da svako od vas ima želju da uradi nešto sam, da ne radi za drugog, da budete dovoljno kreativni pod svojim imenom, ne pod tuđim. Biće promovisano i putem DAFED-a. Aktivni smo na Facebooku, još je samo par dana ostalo za prijavu, prijava je vrlo jednostavna, a onda počinje rad od sredine novembra do sredine decembra. 20 najkreativnijih, inovativnijih ideja bit će stipendirano, tako da u suštini imate šansu da imate besplatnu obuku od strane iskusnih trenera koji su ovome već, da ne kažemo baš koliko godina, onda možete izračunati koliko imamo dovoljno dugo. Ako imate pitanja, tu smo za vas. Pogledajte sajt još jednom nstarter.co odnosno co ili nas pratite na Facebooku. Hvala još jednom i uživajte. I'm sorry and thank you. Thank you, Victoria. We also want to thank our sponsors that are making this event happen every month. Uh, one of our platinum sponsors is uh, Vega IT Sourcing uh, and uh, their CTO will uh, tell us something about their company. Kao što ste čuli, ja dolazim iz firme Vega IT Sourcing. Ne znam koliko vas prati američki futbol. Ja generalno baš i ne pratim, o, iskren da bude ne poznajem sva ta pravila i sve one strategije. Dva, 22 zminsko oko levo i to slično. Međutim, pre neko veče sam gledao TV i Išao je prilog retrospektiva američke lige. I ono što je bilo zanimljivo jeste da je jedan igrač držao loptu u levoj ruci i trčao je neverovatnom brzinom ka protivničkoj zoni, ne bi li postigao touchdown. Fio se je zapitao, sa što je tako sumano to trči, znajući sam da ga niko više ne uri. Svakako će postići touchdown. Tako ponašanje sam video i u drugim sportovima. I to ono što ljudi žargonski zovu ostavio je srce na terenu. Međutim, tu postoji nešto drugo. Trčanje na takav način u stvari znači predanost, znači motivaciju. Znači da biste uradili sve što je u vašoj moći, ne bili ste postigli touchdown. Mi iz Vega IT-a nismo najpametniji. Mi iz Vega IT-a nismo najbolji. Ali ono što radimo, volimo to što radimo. I trudimo se da damo sve od sebe, ne bili smo postigli taj touchdown. I uvek u tom mi istrajemo. I to je ključ našeg uspeha. A naime, kako to postižemo? Pa tako što svi trčimo kao jedan, kao tim. I to je dakle ključ svega. Znamo zašto trčimo. I znamo koji nam je krajnji cilj. A krajnji cilj nije samo neki binaran kod. Je nešto mnogo više, mnogo korisnije. Zahvaljujući odličnoj saradnji sa našim partnerima, farmaceuske kuće sada imaju daleko napređeniji proces pakovanja lekova. 
kompletan televizijski sadržaj sada je dostupan putem bilo kog mobilnog uređaja. Ukoliko vi i ja imamo potrebu da komuniciramo, a ne znamo isti jezik, sada je to moguće. E to je upravo ono u čemu mi učestvujemo. Naši zaposleni su naša najveća vrednost i u njih najviše ulažemo. Za proteklih šest godina, koliko postojimo sa 54 člana, mi smo isporučili više od 200 projekata, uspešno. 26 dotne developera, specializovani iz Epi Server, Sitecore, Braco i SharePoint. 7 PHP developera, specializovani za Magento i Drupal. 7 front-end developera. 7 mobile developera, specializovani za iOS i Android. Svi oni su mogućali da se taj broj svakodivno uvećava. Kao što sam rekao, znanje je najbitnije i tu najviše ulažemo. Tako što naše zaposlenje šaljemo na razne treninge, seminare, čak držimo interna predavanja. A također shvatamo i da je posao poprilično stresan i naporan, pa s tim u vezi organizujemo i drugačije aktivnosti, zabavnog karaktera, sportskog karaktera. Bilo je da je to teretana, karting, paintball, team building, potovanje po Evropi, fun room gde se odmeravaju snage u biljaru i stonom futbolu. VEGAIT je stalno u potrezi za mladim i talentovim osobom kao što ste vi, osobama koje su spremne da trče zajedno sa nama do kraja. Moje ime je Boban i ja vam se zahvaljujem na pašnju. Thank you, Boban. As you all know, tonight we have a special guest from UK. He is a award-winning uh, front-end architect, developer, writer, speaker. He previously worked uh, at BSkyB for clients like BBC and Financial Times. Now he helps uh, tech teams all over the world build better, better products. He specializes in uh, large-scale front-end architecture performance. Uh, he is the man behind the Inuit CSS framework and also a member of Smashing Magazine's experts panel. Please welcome Harry Roberts. That was a very nice introduction. In England, a meetup is about this big, like you guys here. I cannot believe the size of this meetup. This is the size of a decent conference. So the first thing I want you to do is a round of applause for the DAFED team, because this is incredible. Thank you for inviting me over. Um, first time in Serbia. I've spent all of today exploring Novi Sad, a beautiful city. Um, your November regular day is, is better than our summer's day. I can't believe it. In, in, in summer in England, it would have been raining and miserable. The weather's been brilliant. The people are amazing. Uh, so thank you for having me. Uh, who's from Novi Sad? Who is from Novi Sad? Most of you. Who's from elsewhere in Serbia? And I know that some people have actually come from outside of Serbia. Where are you? Wow. I feel very, very honored. So thank you for having me. Anyway, enough of this nonsense. Let's get on with something interesting. Right. My talk is called um, Managing CSS Projects with ITS. Uh, ITS stands for Inverted Triangle CSS. It's an architecture that I've been working on for about three years now. Um, because I'm one of those people where if you have an idea, it's, it can be quite dangerous to just have an idea on Monday and then write it up on Tuesday. You need to you know, give it a test of time, especially something as fundamental as a CSS architecture. So I've been working on the inverted triangle architecture for CSS, or ITS, for about three years. And you can't find any writing about it online. I've not written about it anywhere. So this is kind of like a sneak preview. As a result of it being a sneak preview, I need opinions. So if you want to tell me it sucks, if you want to tell me it's horrible and a bad idea, please do. Uh, the hashtag for this talk, if you want to tweet anything good or bad about it, is simply it. Um, because you know the only people who know about this architecture so far are my clients. Um, I deal with clients all over the world, and this is the kind of thing that I go through with them. It hasn't reached the mass market yet, so I'd be really interested, very, very grateful for any feedback, even just starting that on Twitter. Uh, about me, um, I can't do an intro for myself as well as uh, as has just happened. But my name's Harry. I'm um, a consultant front-end architect from the UK. Now, 
it's my job to travel the world. It's, it's a fantastic job. I can't believe how fortunate I am. Uh, I travel around and meet new clients and hear about problems they're having scaling UIs. I hear about problems they're having specifically with CSS because CSS is horrible and writing that in, in a large team. So most of my clients, fairly big companies, um, you know, lots of developers chipping in, like, uh, contributing to CSS code bases, um, products, so often very long running projects. So it is designed to try and help clients like that. So who here works on products, on startup type things? Oh, wow, this may be the worst talk to give you guys then. No, it, it does work on tiny, tiny websites. I've used it on um, single page marketing sites before. But it's designed, ideally, for scaling CSS, for writing CSS on a large scale. Um, it stands for the Inverted Triangle Architecture for CSS. Uh, it's a SANE scalable managed architecture. Now, what I mean by managed is that it contains your entire app's CSS. It's a very high-level uh, way of thinking. Uh, it's managed because it allows your team and, uh, and your actual code base itself to grow nicely in a very well-rounded manner. Um, it's also a school of thought. Um, so a lot of clients, when I start talking about it, think that it is a framework or a library or a series of mix-ins. Um, it is literally just a way of thinking about how you write CSS projects. So if you use a preprocessor or not, you can use it. If you like underscores instead of camel case, you can still use it. So it is not an open source thing. It's just a, it's a method or a collection of methods of working. Uh, it's also incredibly simple, so please don't expect any mind-blowing, crazy stuff. Um, a lot of the work I do with clients is about telling, telling them that simple is best. The fewer moving parts in a system, the, the stronger, the more robust that system will be. So simplicity is key for me and my work, and that comes through to it. Uh, it exists to try and solve problems with CSS at scale. Has anyone worked on a product where the CSS has got really hairy? You know, it's got just, oh, who did this? Why did you do this? That happens on almost any project, but it gets a lot worse when we start writing large products, when we start writing large UIs. Now, there are a lot of problems with CSS. CSS is terrible, which is why I've managed to make a living out of writing it. If it was easy, I wouldn't have a job. But the, there are two main camps, right? two main divides, I find, in, in the problems with CSS. There are things that CSS gets wrong, and CSS fundamentally makes some mistakes. But we as developers get things wrong all the time. We do some really silly things with CSS. So there, there are two broad categories. There are things that CSS gets wrong. There are things that we get wrong. Um, looking at things that are potentially CSS's fault, the, the first one seems like the weirdest, the cascade and inheritance. Now, that's a key foundation of how CSS works. Um, you know, it's one of CSS's biggest features. But I'm sure you've worked on a code base where you've edited a rule here, and it's just broken something on a page like 100 clicks away. That's because CSS operates in this global namespace where everything cascades and inherits, and every bit of CSS has got the potential to affect something else. It can't be fully encapsulated. So the cascade and inheritance is, is a really leaky, horrible way of working at scale. Uh, it's very loose. So CSS is nice and easy to learn, which is good. You can just view source, and a beginner can pick up how to write CSS. And that's really nice for the web, but it's not nice for developers, mature developers. You can't write CSS in uh, strict mode. There isn't a way of turning on a strict version of CSS. So it's really easy to do nasty things with CSS. And that can be the developer's fault, and it's also CSS's fault for allowing it. It's very highly dependent on source order. Right? I mean, a lot of languages are, but CSS is very highly dependent on source order because things cascade in a certain way, and I'm sure you've tried moving a rule set around a style sheet, and it's broken everything. So even just moving existing CSS around can break a lot of stuff, so we need a way of managing source order effectively. Uh, it's not very expressive. It's a really dull, boring syntax. You know, color, curl on red. It's just, ugh, it's just boring and dull, but as a result, it doesn't tell much of a story. When you try and read someone else's CSS, it's very hard to understand what they were achieving. It's not very expressive at all, which is why we should probably write more documentation. Uh, lots of gotchas. There are some just frankly weird things in CSS uh, that we just can't avoid. CSS is just bizarre. And I've said the best to last, specificity. 
specificity is the worst aspect of CSS because it doesn't matter what cascades to where or what order you've written things in. Specificity can undo everything. Who's ever had like problems with specificity on a project? You know, selectors that are way too, way too specific. Oh, not as many as I would have expected. Yeah, there we go. So we need a way of managing all this terrible stuff, all these things that CSS gets really badly wrong. How do we fix that? Well, that's where it comes in. But before we get to that, what do we do wrong? And we do a lot wrong. I work with a lot of teams. And you know, even good developers who try really hard to be good developers make the same mistakes. It's just a constant thing that I notice. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm no god. I, I do these things myself. But it's a really common occurrence. So we need a way of managing this as well. So things like lack of documentation. Documentation's boring. It's costly to write. You can often spend you know, half a day writing a feature and three days documenting it, right? So we don't bother. Uh, because CSS isn't very expressive, we need documentation, but no one writes it. And I don't blame them because it's boring. Lack of structure or quality assurance. Um, a lot of clients I work with have several different products. So there might be one company that maintains five different sites. Now, with an architecture like MVC, you've got a structure that every site will follow. So you understand that, right, I need to look in the controller for this, or I need to look in the model for that. MVC is a structure that gives developers familiarity. You know where to look for certain things. CSS doesn't currently have any of those paradigms. A mixture of abilities. Every company I've worked in, CSS is edited by everyone. Front-end developers author lots of CSS, but designers more than happy to dive in. Software engineers edit CSS. And that's cool, that's fine, but we need a way of accommodating this because different abilities amount to different levels of quality in the code base. We need to make sure that everyone is writing the same standard. Uh, a lack of knowledge, uh, either about CSS or the project itself. How many times have you come to a project and not known if there are some helper classes available? You've not known if there's a simple SAS variable you can change. Right? Lack of knowledge of a project means inefficient teams, and it means frustration. It means that you come to a new project and you just can't find your way around it. You end up writing new features that perhaps already existed somewhere else because you, know, you couldn't find them because there was no documentation. So lack of knowledge of projects is really detrimental. It hits productivity and it leads to bad performance. Right? You end up writing more CSS than you need to. That's bad for performance. So we need a way of trimming stuff like that down. Simple cosmetic things, people using underscores when you know, the convention is to use hyphens, etc. Really simple stuff. Uh, yeah, not being aware of what exists already, sort of covered that one already. And um, the last one, really, really specific, but adding styles to the end of a style sheet. Honestly, who's done that before? Come on. <laughs> Everyone does it, right? Phase one, you've got a nice, perfect style sheet. Phase two, just stick it on the end. The problem with that is that completely goes against CSS's cascading and source order based nature. And all of a sudden, you've got a really nice style sheet to here, then you just dump complexity on the end of it. We need to get rid of that. Let's look at some of these in a little more um, detail. So the inheritance of the cascade and source order, right? One of CSS's biggest fundamental problems, or three of CSS's biggest fundamental problems. Basically, as I mentioned before, every bit of CSS has the potential to either pass some information on or accept information from another bit of CSS. This is essentially dependencies, right? CSS is a giant global dependency mess. Uh, to kind of illustrate this point, I did right click and inspect element on a simple paragraph on my own website. And you can probably see that all, you probably can't see that at all, all that stuff there contributed to how that paragraph renders. That paragraph only looks how it does because all of this stuff here, this, this reset kind of stuff, all this under here, contributes to how that P renders. These are essentially dependencies. CSS, everything is dependent on something else. Um, it's one giant dependency tree, but like I said, it's more of a, a messy, tangled, horrible web. So we need a way of managing this. Uh, we need a way of managing this on a very, very small scale. So I'm not talking managing dependencies like using NPM or Bower. I'm talking about writing our CSS in a way that those dependencies make more sense. They flow better. They manage themselves. Um, source order, ways of ordering style sheets. So again, I'm going to ask you to put your hands up. Whoever used to write their CSS, or still does, in an order that kind of looks like the web page. And what I mean by that is 
I used to do this years ago. I used to write my header styles, right? I'd have the header styles first, then I'd have the main content styles, and then I'd write my typography styles. Then the last thing in the style sheet would be the footer styles. You'd write a style sheet that kind of looks like the web page. Anyone done that before? Yeah, yeah, and that's a logical way of thinking, um, maybe for small sites, but when you get to a bigger site, again, that doesn't really, it's not very sympathetic to how CSS actually works. It doesn't play well with the cascade and inheritance. Then we move towards thematic chunks, right? So you write all your button styles, and you write all your um, typographical styles. Who does that? Yeah, this is a nice evolution, right? This is a nice step to take. The problem is, what order do we, do we, what order do we put those chunks in? Once we've got these chunks, how do we order those? And then I've said it again, because I want to really drive this home. Phase two, we just stick it all on the end of the style sheet. We've done all this good work, and all of a sudden it's like, oh, put it down there. And it's just, we put all the complexity on the end of the style sheet, and that's where things start to go wrong. Now, any of these methods lead to something like this. Now, this is an entire project's worth of CSS, right? This isn't just one style sheet. This is all the CSS that ends up on the user's machine. If you're, not, if you're not careful and if you write your CSS in a bizarre order, you get something like this, this phenomenon where the browser starts at the top of the style sheet, and it's like, oh, cool, I'll apply that rule, and then I'll apply this rule, and then this one, but oh, there's one up here that overrides that. Okay, right, we'll keep going down here. You get this really erratic kind of all over the place, very inefficient way of working. And it's not inefficient because the browser has more work to do. The browser doesn't struggle with this. But what it means is we've written our CSS in an order that things are undoing other things that were defined earlier on. You know, so this very jumpy notion. Uh, when you do right-click inspect element and you see loads of strikethroughs in, um, in Inspector, in Chrome, that's, that's a result of this. And I call it undoing CSS. Basically, we've written some CSS quite early on. Then we've had to undo it later on, or something at the top overrides it. We're basically writing more CSS to end up with less styling. It's very inefficient. I mean, it can lead to bad performance because the style sheet might blurt, but it's just literally inefficient. We're, we're doing more work than we actually want to end up with. This jumpy kind of nature of how browsers would parse a style sheet, um, or how it would like, uh, choose which rules to apply, is very, very inefficient. We need a way of managing that. So yeah, poor source order uh, with you know, specificity thrown in there, bad management of the cascade, bad management of inheritance, leads to a lot of waste. You know, the amount of style sheets I look at, and like, this never even got rendered. Why is this in here? Like, we've got tons of CSS in here that never even got used. And that's not because someone decided to write a feature that wasn't asked for. That's purely because someone wrote something in a slightly unusual order, which meant that something always gets overridden. And you can never avoid that completely. That will always happen to some degree. But we need a way of writing CSS differently that avoids this waste, that avoids this kind of jumpy, erratic nature of writing CSS. Uh, and then my favorite is specificity. Um, not only is it really hard to say, it's a real hard thing to manage. Uh, so hands up again, who's had the specificity wars? You know, the idea of, uh, okay, I've, I've used an ID, so now I, now I need to use two IDs, and now I need to use an important. Specificity is really, really bad because, as I said before, it doesn't matter how well crafted your architecture is. It doesn't matter how well considered your, you know, the cascade inheritance is. It doesn't matter if you used a beautiful naming convention that keeps everything super clean and everybody uses two spaces instead of tabs. Specificity can undo all of your hard work like that. You know, it just can completely ruin everything. Now, when I work with clients, I, tell, I try and show them how specificity is a bad thing by talking about what I call the specificity graph. I invented the specificity graph quite recently, um, and I wrote about it last week, but other than that, you know, it's not something that's public domain. The specificity graph is a really, really simple visual way of looking at an entire project's specificity. It's a simple line graph, and on the x-axis, we have the location in the style sheet that a, um, a selector was found. On the y-axis, we plot the specificity of that selector. And again, this is the entire project, right? This isn't just uh, one little SAS file. This is the entire project's worth of CSS. Now, if you were to pl uh, plot the specificity of most projects, you'd probably find a graph that looks like this. Um, very erratic. We've got high specificity stuff quite early on, followed by really low specificity things. Uh, perhaps we've got you know, nested selectors or IDs in there, or maybe someone's used important. Now, this isn't bad in itself. What is bad is when you're working in this part of the style sheet. When you've got an ID, 
um, quite early on, every bit of work you do gets you into a, one of these valleys, right? So you've got peaks and troughs, or mountains and valleys. When you're in one of these specificity valleys, when you're working on, on, working on low specificity CSS, you have to climb over those mountains to override them, to overcome them. This is a really good, really simple diagrammatic way of looking at how specificity can cause problems on large projects. I know that if I've got this peak up here, I'm going to have to do a lot of work later on to get over it, and then so on and so on. And this is the specificity wars, where everything gets progressively more specific. So how do we solve this, right? What's the best way of tackling this, this, this shape of graph? Because a spiky graph is a bad thing, right? A spiky graph tells you there are lots of potential problems. How do we solve it? The very short answer is just to write CSS in specificity order, right? Get rid of the peaks and troughs. Um, and it would leave you with a style sheet, uh, uh, a graph, sorry, a specificity graph that trends upwards. So basically, yeah, write CSS in specificity order. Um, and then what we do is we take this graph, and then this is where we start to make sections of style sheets. We chunk things up into specificity. Um, 18 minutes in, and I haven't even mentioned the triangle yet. Um, so basically, these sections form the basis of it. It is a layered architecture, and each of these chunks of specificity form a section in your project. So basically, right, we've just covered a load of problems with CSS. I'm surprised I've managed that in 18 minutes. I could spend 18 years doing it. Basically, the problems we need to solve are we need a sane environment that's accessible to a lot of people, right? We can't escape the fact that everybody needs to write some CSS. What we need to do is make sure it's accessible to them. Tame and manage source order and the cascade, right? That erratic, very jumpy nature of writing CSS is inefficient and wasteful. We need a way of taming the cascade so that even though it operates globally, we aren't writing things that will override other things. Now, we need to create a place for everything to live. I need to know that if I join a project, I can find my helper classes in this directory, and I can find all my uh, link styles in this directory. Right? We need a way of making a familiar environment for people. This will help us reduce waste and redundancy, so it's a nice performance benefit. Um, projects written in the it architecture are typically really, really, really small. I finished a project for the, the NHS, which is England's like, hospital service, and we built a full e-learning platform for the NHS, and it was all fully responsive and all this. And the resulting style sheet was 8.9 kilobytes. It was just absolutely tiny because there was just no waste in there. A lot of bloated CSS is because of CSS that isn't being used. It should be dead easy to trim that stuff out. So CSS can be tiny. What the problem is with CSS, or the reason CSS projects get so big, is because of the amount of waste, the amount of stuff that just doesn't get used. And yes, and the specificity wars. And 20 minutes exactly, we're finally onto the triangle. Um, so yeah, it, uh, ITCSS stands for the inverted triangle architecture for CSS, or just inverted triangle CSS. It's a methodology, right? So it's a school of thought. Like I said, it's not an open source thing. It's not on GitHub. It's a, it's a way of thinking. So you know, if you don't want to use a preprocessor, you don't have to. Um, if you like using underscores, keep writing underscores. Right? It is not a sort of prescriptive framework that you have to adhere to. It's a, it's a concept, right? It's a, a simple high-level architecture. Very, very high level. Um, the interesting thing about it is that um, whilst a lot of methodologies try and avoid CSS's nasty parts, like maybe just using class selectors entirely and not using any element selectors, um, it actually tries to make these weird bits work to our advantage. It tries to get everything pointing in the same direction so that the weird bits of CSS actually become useful. And like I said, it's dead, 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 dead simple. So don't, don't think I'm going to blow your minds. It's a really simple shift in, a way of, in the way we work. And again, yeah, it's a sane, scalable, managed architecture. And the reason it's called the inverted triangle is because it's a very simple diagrammatic representation of an entire project. It's simply this. This represents, again, an entire project's worth of CSS. And what we do is we go from really generic selectors at the start of your project to really explicit ones at the bottom. There are three metrics that we order style sheets by in the it methodology. Generic to explicit. You might have really far-reaching, like a uh, reset stuff at the top, but you might have your uh, helper classes at the bottom. And each layer you go through gets more and more explicit. So this helps you manage the cascade. 
as you get more specific as you go down, it gets rid of the uh, overriding effect. The second metric is far-reaching to very localized. So at the beginning of your project, you need to write things like the star selector, things that can affect the entire DOM. And at the bottom of the project, you have helper classes that only affect one bit of the DOM at a time. And this is what gives you the triangle shape. Each layer represents how much of the project that layer can affect. Uh, and if you stick to these layers, you'll find that a layer here can't damage anything up here. And a layer up here can only cascade nice things down to a layer down here. So we're filtering things by how much of the project they will affect. And finally, back to the specificity graph, we order things from lowest specificity selector, so the star selector, uh, reset kind of things, you know, you know, very low specificity, down to very high specificity selectors at the bottom. These are typically helper classes with uh, importance on them. Uh, did you notice the big spike at the end of the specificity graph? Right, that's the, I'm guessing not. The end of the specificity graph had a massive spike, a massive ramp upwards. Because that's where you put your highest specificity selectors. Now, there are seven default layers in it. And like I said, it's just a school of thought. So these are the default layers, but you can get rid of them if you need to. And these layers are simply settings, tools, generic, base, objects, components, and trumps. Um, if you use a preprocessor, you'll need the first two layers. If you don't use a preprocessor, get rid of them. And I'll go through each of these layers in order. So the default layers, these are when I start a new project and I'm working to the its methodology or I'm consulting with a client and telling them, if they use a preprocessor, the first thing in their project should be settings, high-level settings, global variables. Um, second layer, tools, right? Default mixings, helper, helper functions, that kind of stuff. These are very far-reaching, globally available things. Um, if you're not using a preprocessor, ditch these two layers. You obviously don't need them. The generic layer is ground zero. I call them ground zero styles, like stuff that gets you ready to start work, the normalize, reset, that kind of thing. Uh, the base layer is unclassed HTML elements, so uh, type selectors. Yeah, what does an H1 look like without a class on it? What does a block quote look like without a class on it? Uh, object, who uses object-oriented CSS? Yeah, a few of you, if you use object-oriented CSS, you need the objects layer in there. Um, this would be cosmetic free design patterns. So things that don't really look like anything, but sort structural things out. Um, components, these are fully designed chunks of user interface. This would be your carousel, or it would be your flyout menu. And finally, trumps, helper classes, overrides, utilities, that kind of thing. Each layer in order then, so settings, globally available settings. Who uses a preprocessor? Cool, that's good to see. So if you might have a lot of settings for a lot of things. You might have settings for button colors. Put button color settings inside that SAS, par SAS partial. Um, global settings should come first in a project, but they have to be. They have to be first. You can't put your variables at the end and then try and use them. Uh, config switches, brand colors, for example, you know, color, color values, spacing units. These are globally available variables. These come first in your SAS project. Uh, the layer is nice and wide because these um, variables can be used anywhere else in the project. So the size of the layer shows you how much of the project can use it or how much you can affect the rest of the project. And you chase that up with tools. So globally available tools like mixins, helper functions. Um, again, you might have private mixins. Keep those in the relevant file. Any global mixins come after the settings. They come after the settings because you know it might take one of the very a, a mixin might take one of the variables as a default argument, a default parameter. But they need to come before the rest of your project because otherwise you wouldn't be able to use them. So basically, the first two layers are really obvious. They have to come first. But they're a nice wide layer because they can affect a lot of the project. You might have a mix in to spit out some brand font information, right? We're all probably used to using stuff like this. And then next is the generic layer. This is the first layer that actually produces any CSS. Uh, the generic layer is ground zero styles. Low specificity, very far reaching. So far reaching, it's nice, that's a nice wide layer. But low specificity because, uh, and that's why it's near the top. Um, examples would be the star selector. The lowest specificity selector there is, so it comes quite early on in the project. It wouldn't make sense putting this at the very end. But also it affects a lot of the DOM, so it's got a nice wide layer to live in. Next we have the base layer. Uh, the base layer is basically any unclassed HTML element. So this layer is a little more explicit than the reset layer, because we're saying, 
What does an H1 look like without a class on it? What does a link look like without a class on it? Um, this is the last layer we find type selectors as well. We wouldn't find any classes in this. Uh, they're called type selectors because they select a type of element. But that's really confusing because they have nothing to do with typography necessarily. They're just called type selectors. So this is the layer where you write, you know, like I say, what does an H1 look like without a class on it? What does a UL look like before I put a class on it? So you're getting slightly more explicit. You're saying every type of element, but it's still low specificity. So it comes in a layer before any classes. If you were to have classes before this, they'd struggle to override things. Then you'd get the erratic up and down nature of the, uh, the old, old way of working. A really good example is just UL. Right? Any list I put in this site that doesn't have a class on it, I need square bullet points. Next, we've got the objects layer. And again, if you don't use object-oriented CSS, you don't need this layer. Um, but these are design patterns. No cosmetics. These layers, the, these sort of selectors don't look like anything. They're just design patterns. So if you use object-oriented CSS, the media object would go in here. This is when we begin to use classes. This is the first layer we introduce class selectors. So we're bumping up the specificity a little bit. That's why it's in a lower layer. But we're affecting slightly less of the DOM. So we might have a UL that affects every UL, on, a UL selector, sorry, that affects every UL on the site. Then we might have 10 types of UI list. And we choose very agnostic names here. We choose names that don't describe the content. So the object layer might have something like UI list, takes the bullet points and indents off of a list, and puts some padding on the list items. This layer is slightly more explicit than the uh, base layer. It's definitely higher specificity because we've introduced classes, but we're still trying to affect quite a large part of the DOM. You can have the UI list class on 10 lists on a page, right? So it's slightly more explicit, but it's not necessarily pinpointing one part of the DOM. Next layer, components. So components um, is designed stuff, right? This is when you've got your carousel. This is when the UI list becomes specifically a product list. So this is where you get more explicit. Um, we don't necessarily get higher specificity. We still use classes. Um, but we're getting more explicit. So you might style 10 UI lists and then just style one product list. So the specificity is the same, but we've got more explicit. So it comes in a lower layer, and we're affecting slightly less of the DOM, so the, na the layer is narrower. Yeah, products list. Here we can see we're utilizing some of the mixings and settings. Um, and, and that's how that layer works. And the final layer is called the trumps layer. Um, quick show of hands, who actually knows what the word trumps means? Like three people, right? I need to rename this layer. Uh, trumps is a, probably a very British word, I imagine. Um, trumps just means to win, right? If you want to trump, you need to, it also in English means fart. Um, so I, I definitely need to rename this layer. Um, I don't mean it in, in, in the fart sense. Uh, or maybe you tell me. Um, but trumps just means to win. And it actually comes from this game, Top Trumps. Uh, it's a game where two players are given a card. The card's got a number on it. Whoever has the highest number wins. So there's no elegance. There's no skill involved in this game. It's just about winning. And this is what the trumps layer does. It's overrides. It's helper classes. Very high specificity. I'll just flick back to this slide. They usually carry important on them. So if you've got a class which is dot .hidden, you'd have like display non important because you want that class to win. You only put it on one part of the DOM at a time, so it needs to be very high specificity. This is the trumps layer. Um, after this game, top trumps. A really boring game as well. An example might be a, a helper class like one half. You only use this class because you want something to be 50% width, right? This is, a, this is an override, so this has important on it. So basically, what you should find going through each, the, each of these layers, and as the layers get narrower, we slowly increase specificity across the project. The specificity graph, should I answer that? Uh, the specificity graph gets steadily increases, right? It trends upwards. So each layer we go down, we slowly increase specificity. Uh, we affect smaller bits of the DOM at a time, so that's why the inverted triangle comes in. We are writing our CSS in an order that we affect a lot of the DOM, then a bit less, then a bit less, then a bit less, until we're right at the very tip of the triangle, which means that we're affecting just a tiny, tiny amount of the project. Um, the triangle, if you imagine um, that the way it manages the cascade is if you think of a, a waterfall, like a really slow running waterfall, and it comes over the edge of a cliff or whatever, and it always gathers, it kind of gathers into like a pinpoint, like one spout at the end of the waterfall. Basically, what the inverted triangle is, it, is it causes rules to slowly trickle together and, and basically cascade um, 
into a unified point. So we get this triangle shape. Um, and we're progressively adding styles. This is the key bit. This is the bit that helps with performance, and this is the bit that helps with specificity wars, and this is the bit that helps with you know, global, um, you know, global styles that override things. We're progressively adding styles. We're never undoing anything. So now our source order looks a lot more like this. You just simply add bits on. You layer things on so that you're not undoing things. Um, it means that your global styles happen really early. So it means that all of your lists look like this. But then this one looks a bit different, then this one looks a bit different, and then this one here, this specific one, looks different again. So we're adding styles on very, very gradually. This is because of essentially just writing CSS in specificity order. Uh, the next slide, you're going to have to bear with me because I've got a really weird accent, which I'm sure you've already noticed. When I say O, as in like code, it comes out like curd. So in the next slide, when I say the word cone, I mean like an ice cream cone. It just sounds weird. I'll say kern. That probably sounds like kern, which is what you do to typography. I don't know. If you imagine the triangle is at like an ice cream cone and you look into it, so you look into the top of the triangle, you've got like this, this kern shape. And the first layer, laughing, kern. It's a kern, right? So you've got this, this layer that affects all of the project, right? The top layer, you look down and see, right, we've affected everything here. Then the next layer affects a bit less and a bit less and a bit less. And you're slowly picking off bits of the project, and you're progressively styling smaller bits of the DOM at a time. Reducing redundancy, the amount of CSS that goes to waste is, is much, much less. Um, and you're just targeting things in a much more sane manner. It's just a much nicer way of working. So yeah, it's manager source order. We know that our source order now is roughly specificity based. Um, our source order is based on how much of the DOM it affects, down to like the very, very skinniest point. It filters explicitness. Like I say, imagine the trickling kind of effect of a waterfall. We can affect a lot, and then a little bit less, then a little bit less, until we get to this point right at the bottom where we've got the most explicit selectors. And you know, we don't always have to go right to the point. We could just stop at uh, just a UL, right? We could always just do the first three layers, and then it might not need like the bit of DOM you're working on might not need any more styling after that. But we could go right through to the very bottom layer if we need to. It tames the cascade. So we looked at the jumpy nature of CSS. Using it, it's just really progressive. Um, whenever you do a right click and inspect element on an it-based project, you typically find that the amount of strike throughs is really, really low. You can, you can see how much waste you've removed. And it sanitizes inheritance. You've no longer got this idea of a low specificity selector down here and a high specificity, specificity selector up here. You know, this can't inherit, oh sorry, this can't inherit the stuff down here because it's defined after it. You need to write things in an order that inherits logically. Uh, I kind of um, see every layer as like a pass over the DOM, right? The concentric circles we looked at, each layer represents refinement. I compare this to how a sculptor works. Imagine a sculptor's making a statue, uh, like this shape statue. What they would do is they would go to a quarry and get a gigantic bit of stone, right? They'd order a giant bit of stone. Then they'd get it cut down into a square or a cube. Then they'd get a big hammer and a big chisel, and they'd make it into a rough shape of a person, right? You'd have some legs, maybe the shape of a head and an arm. Then they'd get a smaller tool, and they'd add some refinement, so they'd add a hand, right? Rather than just being like a protruding thing, they'd make it look like a hand. And they'd go and add more refinement. Then the last pass, the last thing that sculptor will do is go with a really fine chisel and add details, fingernails, eyelashes, hair. Every layer is a refinement of the DOM. Uh, you wouldn't get a sculptor, or I'd be very surprised if you got a sculptor who got a massive, massive cube of, of rock and just made a perfect little finger. And that was it. And then they moved on to like the perfect elbow. They would do it in layers of refinement. You would start really rough, so the first layer of the triangle, just take the margins off of everything, then slowly refine the DOM as they, as they work, or, the, or the, the statue as they work. So yeah, each layer is basically more detailed and explicit than the last. Make sure every layer adds things and doesn't undo things. The results of this, and what does this actually give us? Well, everything now has its place to live. You onboard a new developer, right? You hire a new developer. You can tell them about the its architecture. You can say that, look, if you need to edit um, type selectors, this is where you need to look. If you need to edit some uh, overrides, this is the layer you need to look in. 
Like really good for introducing new people to projects. Really good for existing projects or, or like developers who have to work on several projects at a time. Like I said, if you work on an MVC architecture, you can probably find your way around any given project. You'll know that, right, this lives in the controller. With it, you've got a similar kind of thing. You know that if you move to uh, one it project from another, you can find your components in the correct place. Um, this, yeah, this means that people know where to look, which means we reduce inefficiency, we reduce, we, we reduce waste. People don't define the same thing three times. Um, we've got a sane source order. We've got a source order now that works to our advantage. We are not undoing things. We're not trying to fight our way out of the specificity wars. We're not doing anything crazy to try and you know, undo work that we did six months ago because we've written everything in a really logical order where we're only adding new things in. Uh, increased scalability. So we haven't talked about scalability yet. Um, it's really easy to scale its projects because, um, well, it's just much simpler. One of the hardest things about scaling CSS is that it doesn't make sense. It's an awful language. Once you've tried to tame it, once you've tried to make sense of it, it's easier for people to actually write it um, you know, in, into that project, and it's easier for people to grow that project. Uh, and yeah, the specificity wars are over. By and large, you will still get the odd thing that might trip you up, but by and large, the majority of specificity problems have, have gone. So yeah, scaling it. How do we make its projects bigger? Well, it's, it's interesting. It can help um, make our actual code base bigger. See, that's another thing I say, curd, curd base. It's a good job they don't sell curd in kerns. Um, we can scale our CSS much more easily. The actual CSS project becomes loads more scalable because we can put things in the right place. Um, you know, we're not having this undoing thing. Um, we can just keep the size of the project way, way down. One thing I always tell clients is the easiest project to maintain is the smallest one. Just reducing the amount of code instantly makes something easier to maintain unless you've done a particularly bad job. Um, so yeah, scale CSS much more easily, but we can actually scale the architecture. So you know how I mentioned that if you don't use a preprocessor, you can get rid of the, um, the settings and tools layer? If you don't use object-oriented CSS, you can get rid of that layer. We can actually, um, we can actually scale the, the architecture itself. So yeah, scaling our CSS, we don't have the end of a style sheet problem anymore. We've got rid of that. So we're not just dumping complexity like you know, way down here. Um, we add things into the relevant layers, and it's usually the last ones. So if you've made a style for all um, ULs across a site, it'd be very, very dangerous to add a new rule for just a raw UL selector. Six months down a project, you shouldn't really be editing such global uh, selectors. You should only be adding new classes to extend functionality. There's a software engineering principle called uh, the open-closed principle, and the open-closed principle basically states that Things should be open to extension, but closed for modification. The inverted triangle makes you extend everything. It means that you don't go back in and just suddenly change the color of all the headings everywhere. Because if you were to edit an H1 selector, that's going to trickle right down. So most of the work in the inverted triangle happens in the last few layers, where you can add new classes to make things more explicit. Uh, unless you actually do want to change the global appearance of an H1, uh, then, then you would do it in the base layer. Uh, things never get more complicated, just bigger. So you can add more stuff into each layer, and the entire project grows really nicely. So the problem with the end of a style sheet is that the project grows down here somewhere, and this, this just stays the same size, and this, this gets bigger. Uh, for you at the back, that probably looks really weird. So now you can scale the entire architecture, right? Everything grows in a well-rounded manner. Uh, and the specificity graph keeps trending upwards. Specificity is one of the hardest things to scale in a CSS project. So if we just write CSS in specificity order, things are getting progressively more specific, things get easier to manage. But yes, yeah, scaling the architecture itself. Well, you can add and remove layers. Like I said, don't need a preprocessor, get rid of those two layers. Um, a lot of clients need theming, right? So they need to add a theme layer. You just pop a theme layer in after the components layer. If you need to add a little more explicitness to a project, think of where that layer should exist and, and just stick it in. You can have a theme layer before the trumps layer. There's no reason you couldn't do that. I did a bit of work with uh, Booking.com last year, and they do a lot of A-B testing. And they asked me, like, you know, where should we put our A-B test rules? Where should we write styles for A-B tests? Because what happens is we run a test, and then you know, test B wins, but we leave test A's CSS in the code base, right? It's really wasteful. So I said, well, create a test layer. Tests are more explicit than components, so create yourself a test layer. Right? Just before the overrides, 
a new place to put this code, run your tests, whichever one wins, in, uh, incorporate it back into the components layer. Um, so add layers wherever you need to, right? The only key thing is that you add them in the right place. Add them in a way that you're increasing specificity, not going back down. Like, you shouldn't ever put a low specificity selector after a class, for example. And you shouldn't be writing really explicit stuff really early on. Because if you imagine reordering the layers of the triangle, it wouldn't be a triangle anymore. It would go up and then up really far, then right in and out a little bit. Make sure it always looks like a triangle. No matter how you write your project or no matter how many layers you add, just keep the triangle shape. Very far-reaching selectors at the top. Right? This layer has a, the ability to affect a lot of the DOM. But this little layer down here, very explicit, can only affect a little bit of the project. Um, and yeah, honor the specificity graph. Um, really near the end of the talk now, I've got a couple of really crude screenshots for how this looks on the file system. Um, basically, I don't know if you can see that. That's probably not big enough at the back, is it? Um, I can't zoom that, I don't think. Yeah, sorry. Especially for those who can't see at the back, and the slides are online. I've, I've stashed them somewhere for you. Basically, the paradigm I use is each file has the name of the layer, then the name of the file itself. So you can see we've got um, base.type, base.links. Um, the reason I do it this way rather than in a directory is that it forces the next developer to pick a layer. If we just had a directory called components, people could just dump anything in there. Actually having to type out components.carousel forces the next developer to honor this system. Um, also means I can really find all my component styles, all my um, uh, trumps and overrides. Um, this is straight from, from my website, which is on GitHub. So if you want to go and actually look at this for real, um, cssWizardry.com CSS -wizardry on GitHub. Um, this is just a screenshot of that. And this is, this is how it looks in a SAS file. And you just import these things in the correct order. You've got a chunk of your base rules. You've got a chunk of your component rules. Um, and it's as simple as that. You know, decide, right, I'm adding some new styles for a carousel. Well, a carousel is cl clearly not a generic thing. It's obviously going to be a, a component. So create a new components.carousel.scss and then import that into the right place. If you're not using a preprocessor, you could either do this at build time or you could just write this into one big style sheet in, in this order, right? So it's not, you don't have to use a preprocessor, but if you do, this is how it would end up looking. Uh, so two slides from the end. So um, just to recap then, try and wrap all that up. Write CSS in specificity order, right? The quickest way to writing more scalable, maintainable CSS projects is write CSS in specificity order. Right? That's the simplest start. This allows you to maintain the specificity, specificity graph. So remember I said that ups and downs are really bad news. Get rid of those ups and downs. Make sure that graph always just slopes upwards. All rule sets should only ever add to and um, inherit from other CSS. If you ever write some CSS that seems to be undoing a lot of stuff you've done before, perhaps the CSS you're writing needs to exist earlier. Or maybe the thing that already exists needs refactoring to be slightly lower specificity. Um, as soon as you find yourself writing CSS that undoes other CSS, that's, that's potentially bad news. Um, so writing CSS in specificity order helps you avoid this from the get-go, helps you avoid it right from the start. Uh, Far-reaching to very localized, so that's what gives us the triangle, right? Otherwise, it would just be a series of blocks, but far-reaching to very localized is what gives us the triangle shape. So if you can try and visualize your CSS project and, and if it looks like it might be a triangle shape, then that's good news. Uh, one thing I didn't actually mention, uh, overrides and helpers. A lot of people include those really early on, in, early on in a project because they feel quite global or they feel like they're quite uh, frameworky, like, so like frameworky helper classes. The problem is that if you were to put your helper classes right at the beginning, you've got a massive spike in the specificity graph straight away. So that's why you put your helper classes right at the end. Your utility classes exist at the end of a project. Uh, and yeah, add layers as much as you need. Um, if you need a test layer, add one. If you need um, a theming layer, add one. If you don't need preprocessor layers, remove them. But make sure they go into the right place. Keep the triangle shape. And that is me saying thank you very much for listening. If you want the slides, um, 
that is the URL. And I believe taking questions. Anyone got any questions? Really good question. Um, the question is, where do media queries fit into this architecture? And um, it's my fault for leaving that out. It's a really good question. Thank you. Um, media queries, I put them with the rules that they affect. So I don't have like a media queries layer because that would affect the source order. So if I had a media queries layer, I might have uh, a class and a type selector in there. And that would just make the layer a bit of an odd shape. So media queries, I always write them with the block of code that they're affecting. I don't, I don't move them somewhere else. Uh, so it's basically a question of writing a um, JS hint, JS lint style plugin to make sure that the code you're actually writing is kept very, um, yeah. Basically, it's all well and good saying that you should write your CSS like this, but is there a tool to enforce it? And have I considered making one? Uh, the answer is I haven't. I'm afraid. I mean, it would be really good. I, I think I, I completely lack. Yeah, so it is much easier to follow an architecture when it's one person. But a lot of the work I do is, is forcing teams to just work harder. Um, it's brilliant. Like Plugins really, really do help. They make it very easy. But it is something that I sit teams down and I say, look, right, this is how we work. If you've got any, I, I run a lot of, in, well, when I used to work for my previous company, I ran a lot of internal workshops. I would say to people, look, if you're going to write any CSS whatsoever, you have to come to this workshop that I'm running. Um, if you don't come to this workshop and you write some bad CSS, I will delete it from the code base or refactor it or you'll have to do it again. Sounds very brutal but it's a really good way of making teams understand the importance of structured ways of working. But even simpler would be a plugin. Uh, if you fancy writing one, I'll let you do it. Uh, hi, this question came up on Twitter, so I just thought I'd, I'd ask you now and get an immediate response. Um, do you have any advice for integrating this philosophy into an existing project that's kind of falling apart as far as CSS goes? Yeah, so refactoring CSS is the worst job in the world. Um, and I do quite a lot of it. The easiest way to get an existing project back onto the inverted triangle is just try and take stock of everything you've got, right? Try and get a good overview of the entire project. Then put classes on everything, right? Absolutely everything. Just class everything up. Who's familiar with the BEM methodology, BEM? So the BEM methodology tells you to just use classes everywhere. So to start refactoring this, what I do is I, I find things that are really, really bad selectors, and I just put a class on it. So I end up with a code base that's all classes. This means that the, uh, I've only got one layer, which is the, did anyone get the URL? Um, so yeah, you end up with a components layer that's enormous. Everything's got a class on it. But then at least you can see, right, well, these are some common traits between components. I'll refactor those into one object and two components. And you might find that, right, well, I've got five different types of H1 that have got different classes on, but they all have the same font size. Then you create your base layer out of that. So the simplest, I mean, oh, I say simple. It's never going to be easy. But the, probably the most effective, pragmatic way of doing this is move everything to the components layer, just move everything there completely, then refactor back out. Um, you know, Try and get rid of globally operating. Um, you know, if you've got a selector like dot body h1, um, that affects every h1 in the body. Maybe just give that a class of dot body h1. Move all to the components layer, spot similarities, and then refactor back out. It'll, it'll never, ever, ever be an easy job, but that's the easiest way I've found so far. Any other questions? So yeah, the question is, um, if you move to an architecture like this, you will find you're using a lot more classes. Um, and a lot of developers still don't like the idea of using lots of classes. Uh, my answer to that is the complexity has to exist somewhere. Um, adding more classes to some HTML, if that takes a lot of complexity out of your CSS, that's worth it. Has anyone spent weeks, days, weeks refactoring CSS? Has anyone ever torn their hair out refactoring markup? No, because markup, oh, a couple of people, right? But markup is tons easier to understand than CSS, because CSS is 
such a nasty, tangled dependency mess, it's easy to look at a div with five classes and see, right, well, we've got one, two, three, four, five things. If you look at some CSS, you can't work out what that's doing anywhere near as easily. So basically, I think it's really wise, especially on large projects, to instead of having all your complexity in the CSS and having really lightweight markup, balance it out. You know, if using four classes instead of one makes your job easier, then do that. Because users, users don't care how many classes you use. Um, search bots don't care how many classes you use. And if you're worried about performance, you can uglyfy. You can use something like uh, Google's closure style sheets to you know, uglyfy those classes. Um, what else could you do? Uh, there's another thing. Um, oh, that's it. And if you feel like you've got a lot of classes repeated in your markup, you need to start drying your views out more. Like repeating classes in compiled markup is not a problem, right? No one cares about that. But if you're worried about the fact that I need to change a button, therefore I need to open 10 different views and edit it in 10 places, perhaps you should make use, uh, use better templating systems. Uh, you know, dry out your views a little more if you can. So yeah, as far as adding more classes, I think um, there are some really solid actual arguments that don't just, there's like some objective arguments for using more classes. And uh, yeah, I've had developers I've worked with who spent two years, this, this is true, right? I worked with a guy for two years, and he was a software engineer and I was the front end dev. For two years he told me that I didn't know how to do my job. He was like, oh, this is messy and all these classes in this HTML. Anyway, I left Sky and he sent me a tweet, uh, Sky is the company I used to work for, I left this company, and six months later, he sent me a tweet. Hey, I was just working on some CSS that you didn't write. You were correct. It's much better to move complexity on markup. Because he couldn't untangle someone else's CSS. This CSS had too much complexity in there. Move that complexity to your markup. Don't be afraid of using more classes. Um, you know, I don't think anyone's ever really come that, you know, in, into that much trouble by using a few more classes. That's a very long answer. You can tell that I, I like answering that question. There are other edge cases, though, like perhaps you use a CMS where you can't add as many classes, and that is difficult, and there's no real way of solving that. A real hacky way would be to inject the classes via JS, um, which is ugly, but it works, you know, and, and again, as long as it works, that's what really matters. Um, if you can't edit uh, HTML directly, then you're kind of stuck in a, a less than ideal situation. Any more questions? Uh, how does it CSS fit into the web components world of encapsulated web components? Web components might make me redundant. Like, after web components land, I might not need to do this job anymore. Um, if you're doing web components, um, you'd probably put them in the components layer. If you need to handle, if you, any site that uses web components will have some global stuff. Like, you know, you might have a site that every link is a certain color. But um, you'll still have a component in there that's different. So you'd probably have a triangle still. You'd still need to manage some global variables. But then all your web component stuff would just fit into the components layer. Um, web components will make managing CSS tons, tons simpler. So we'll need to rely less on things like it. We'll need to use BEM a little less. You know, we'll, we'll be much freer to use web components eventually. Um, but we'll still have a lot of global stuff. You could write a web component itself in it. You might have a web component that's a calendar, and you might have a low specificity selector like star margins off of everything. So you could still use the inverted triangle within a web component, and then you could build your calendar widget in the inverted triangle. Then basically you'd have a real funky looking meta triangle that's full of triangles. So yeah. yeah but uh, the situation is when, uh, when you want to style something, uh, of when you're building a UI kit, a UI framework, uh, you have to style multiple components. So you have a specificity problem with when you use, uh, you must use global styling for all of the components with deep, deep, deep and uh, other shadow DOM uh, selectors. But then you have a problem on the local component scale. Yeah, so you would get into problems like that, I guess. I mean, I have to be completely honest, I haven't done anything with web components yet, so it's not something I've solved. Um, if anyone knows any good articles, tweet those with the its hashtag, then I can learn something. Um, but I imagine, yeah, with, with global high-level stuff, we might need to reconsider it or, or write something completely different. Um, it's honestly not something I've done with it yet. Okay, thank you. 
stand and shout. <laughs> Uh, I have a question about uh, class modifiers. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, we have a button with a basic style, and uh, under it we have the same button with uh, slightly different, like uh, bigger height, uh, color differences, and something like that. Uh, I think there will be uh, spikes in the graph well, with the class modifiers. I do something like this. Um, so this would be one rule, and then I'd have dot b t n large. Oh, it's turned into an m dash. Uh, okay, well let's not go bemi. Let's just do that. In the markup, I'd have two classes, but these are only one. Well, these are only one class deep, so these are the same specificity as each other. But if you were to do something like dot b t n, um, a selector like this. So it's got a class of button and a class of large. You would get small spikes in the specificity graph, but the point or the idea is that it trends upwards. So you might have, if you were to zoom right in on the specificity graph, you might see little bits of like sawtooth up and down. If you zoom right out, the general trend should always be going up. So yeah, you'll definitely get things like that. Or you might get, um, actually no, that's a that's a perfect example. Yeah, different size buttons. Um, or you might get like a. If you follow Smack's style naming, you might have dot foo dot is open. That's two classes deep, so it's double the specificity. So you would get a little kink in the graph, um, but the, the general idea is that it trends upwards. Any other questions? Cool. So the question was, can I elaborate on, uh, I've got an open source CSS framework called Inuit CSS. Inuit CSS is the result of three years of me getting CSS frameworks wrong. Um, I gave a talk uh, actually in Croatia um, earlier this year, um, and that was all about you know, CSS frameworks and my opinions on them. Inuit CSS is a very, very low specificity. Uh, sorry, um, what they do is it keeps low specificity, so it's got all the principles of it, um, but it's just like a, a collection of objects and abstractions, basically. Uh, Inuit CSS is an actual framework. It's so I said it isn't a library. It isn't a framework. If you wanted an it framework, uh, Inuit CSS is that. What I've done is I've kept them separate because I don't want to force people to have to use my framework. So I've written up the architecture that guides the framework as it. And if you're really into that and you want to help get or you want a hand getting started with it, uh, Inuit CSS is the best place to start. Uh, every client project I work on, every time I consult with a company, uh, everything I build for myself uh, is built on Inuit CSS. Is that good enough for the, that half of the question? And the second question, what are my thoughts on Bootstrap? Um, how long have we got? No, so. The talk I gave in Croatia earlier this year was about CSS frameworks and the current state of them. Now, the problem is Bootstrap isn't a CSS framework, right? Bootstrap's a UI toolkit. Um, Symfony is a PHP framework. WordPress is a blogging platform. So they're like, one's a product and one's a framework. Does that make sense? Does that analogy sit well? It's like, you could write your own blogging engine using Symfony, but if you want a blogging engine out of the box, you would use WordPress. So Inuit CSS is a framework, right? It doesn't do any styling. It's about, you know, it kind of brings the MVC, not actual MVC, but it brings an architecture to CSS. It doesn't do any, like, cosmetic stuff, so it doesn't tell you what color buttons you want. So it means it can be used on any project. Like, literally every project I work on uses Inuit CSS, but every single one looks different. Bootstrap is fantastic if you need design. If you need a UI, you would use a UI toolkit. So that might be Foundation, it might be Bootstrap. Um, a lot of people think I, I dislike Bootstrap. What I actually think is that the people who complain about Bootstrap aren't Bootstrap's intended audience. So I've got a friend who's a fantastic open source engineer. He does loads of open source work. He needs documentation for a, you know, um, a Docker thing that he, he's written. He uses Bootstrap because he needs some decent looking buttons. He needs a nav, right? That's, why, that's when you'd use Bootstrap. Where you hit problems using things like Bootstrap is if you try and use it like a framework. Imagine taking, maybe WordPress is a bad example because of the amount of plugins involved, but you couldn't really, no, you could, that's terrible. 
basically, imagine old-fashioned WordPress before plugins and before it became so complex. Imagine WordPress was still just a blogging platform. You'd really struggle to write uh, an e-commerce platform in WordPress because you, you're trying to pull one product into another. So I think with Bootstrap, um, it's fine if you need something to look like Bootstrap. And I don't think it's a bad thing. I think that when developers say that I hate Bootstrap, my answer is usually, yeah, but it's not for you. It's not for you. You can write your own CSS. You have your own designs. Using Bootstrap would be inappropriate. And the, the basic, basically, it boils down to one is a CSS framework, Inuit CSS, a suit CSS by Nicholas Gallagher. Um, those are frameworks. Bootstrap Foundation, these are UI toolkits. They're prepackaged bits of design. So I think they're fundamentally different. I think that's where a lot of the confusion comes from. Whew, I've got a lot of opinions, haven't I? Also including the uh, Bootstrap. Uh, so if you have a client who just, you know, just want to use Bootstrap and you cannot uh, uh, make, it, uh, make it out of, of, out of that, uh, are there any uh, best practices how to uh, incorporate uh, that ITCSS with a with a booster because you will actually have a big, bigger spikes if you need to or write something after including the all the booster components and everything. So it's yeah the it problem be a pretty much messy. So the problem with things like Bootstrap is you download like this massive like lump of CSS, and if you want to update Bootstrap, you can't edit it. So it means you can work before Bootstrap or you can work after Bootstrap. Basically, you write stuff in front of it include it and then write stuff after it. Or you could dive straight in there and not have it package managed. You could edit Bootstrap directly. If you can edit Bootstrap directly, you'd have quite a lot of time refactoring it. But most people use Bootstrap and try and layer things on top of it. This is where we hit this problem of the specificity like up and down thing. Um, if you can't refactor the code, it's really hard to move it onto the triangle. Because um, Bootstrap is essentially your work, uh, Bootstrap and then all your work to override it. In theory, that does send the specificity graph up because you are being more explicit. The problem is that the bootstrap in between, that's hugely up and down. If you can't, if you can't edit bootstrap directly, I'm afraid it's kind of bad news. Um, it'd be really interesting. So my talk about CSS frameworks, uh, Mark Otter, who, who makes bootstrap, stopped following me after I gave that talk. And it wasn't, I didn't say anything bad, I don't think. Um, so I can't really get in touch with him to ask about refactoring Bootstrap onto the triangle. Or if I could, it'd be really awkward, because, hey, I would have DM'd you, but you stopped following me. Um, but I'd be really interested to talk to people you know, like Bootstrap, like Foundation, and sort of say, look, this is a high-level architecture. Feel free to incorporate it, and I'll explain why. But yeah, currently, if it's not already on it, and you can't refactor it onto it, you've probably got a lot of headaches. Is anyone's question, where is the beer? No one. <laughs> Second three? You know where it is, yeah. Actually, yeah, my question is, where is the beer? Uh, are there any more questions about nerdy stuff? Before everyone stands up, before everyone stands up, I'm going to do it. I've never spoken at a meetup this big, so when I go back to England, I need to be able to show them that I need to, right. Oh, I've got my finger in it. Hey, thank you, everyone. <laughs>